Welcome to this video on cardiovascular physiology. All right, so to understand some of the terminology that's used, um, I'm going to introduce you first to the cardiac cycle. So this cycle is actually pretty straightforward. It starts with ventricular filling. That's when blood fills up the ventricles. And then the next phase is called ventricular systole. The word systole means contraction. So during ventricular filling, blood enters the ventricles. During ventricular systole, blood is pumped out. And then the third phase is uh, when the heart begins to relax and is yet not yet ready to be filled again though. So three phases of the cardiac cycle, ventricular filling, ventricular systole, and isovolumetric relaxation. So now let's take our red pen and uh, show how oxygenated blood during ventricular filling is coming from the lungs down through the left atrium into the left ventricle. And at the same time, blood from the body is, is deoxygenated, so now I'm using a blue pen, is coming in the vena cava into the right atrium and passing down to the right ventricle. So both of these ventricles are filling at the same time, and they will reach a total volume that we'll call end diastolic volume. So this one will have the same end diastolic volume as this side. Okay, then in ventricular systole, blood gets pumped out. So the pressure gradually builds, or pretty rapidly builds, in the left ventricle to the point where the blood is ejected out through the semilunar valve and the aorta. So I'm using that red pen again to show the movement of oxygenated blood out of the heart during ventricular systole. And then we'll use um, the blue pen again to show at the same time ventricular ejection out through the pulmonary semilunar valve and to the lungs from the right ventricle. Okay, and then the next thing I want to draw your, oh, sorry, and so then whatever uh, gets pumped out is called stroke volume, and whatever's left over is called end systolic volume, so the volume at the end of systole. So now let's go back up here and let's label our valves. So I want to use a green um, highlighter to label the AV valves. Here they are. So the atrioventricular valves separate the atria from the ventricles. And notice that during ventricular filling, both of these are open. And that's because uh, pressure is low. If pressure increases in the ventricle, those things will slap shut. And you can see that that is what happens. So at the end of end diastolic volume, the heart muscle begins to contract, and that's why right here I've drawn it like a kind of narrower and tighter as it's pushing blood up. And as soon as this ventricle starts to tighten, the chordae tendinae that hold these AV valves will slap shut. So um, actually all of the valves are closed at the beginning of systole, and then when the blood is actively being ejected, the AV valves remain closed. Now, if there is some sort of problem with this, then when the blood is being ejected, a little bit of the blood could squirt, squirt back into the left atrium, and that would be called um, a mitral valve prolapse, specifically if it's on this side, or it might be heard as a heart murmur. And that may indicate a valve problem. Another thing I'd like to note is that when these AV valves slap closed at the, be at the beginning of ventricular systole, uh, you can hear a lub sound. So this phase actually starts with the closing of the AV valves. And that is that first lub heart sound. 
Okay, so then let's go back up here to our ventricular filling and see when the ventricles are filling, what is going on with the semilunar valves. I'm gonna do those in purple. So they are both closed at this point, but what's funny is that they're closed for the same reason that the AV valves are open. These valves only can open under high pressure, so under low pressure they are closed. So they are closed because pressure is low. So let's go see what happens to them during systole. So during contraction, the pressure builds and builds and builds until the semilunar valves open. So notice that um, an isovolumet isovolumetric contraction, all the valves are closed. The word iso means same and volume. So it means that even though the muscle cells are shortening, they're contracting, even though that's happening, the pressure is not yet high enough to open the semilunar valves. But during ejection then, the semilunar valves are open and that's because pressure became high enough to overcome afterload. So afterload is the um, measure of the resistance from the arteries. Okay, so it became high enough to open those. Um, if someone has high blood pressure, we say they have high afterload. Whatever blood was ejected during ventricular ejection is called stroke volume. So stroke volume is the amount of blood that was pumped. In one contraction. And we can look at that. Um, so if N systolic volume is typically about 50 milliliters of blood that's left, we can draw that on here. So at the very end, you, you don't pump all the blood out of the heart in one contraction. You should pump the same out of both sides though. So about 50 mils left in this side and in this side. And then compare that with end diastolic volume up here, EDV, which is going to be about 120 mils. So we can use our red pen here and our blue pen here. So these should fill with the same amount. Then 120 mils minus 50 mils will equal stroke volume. So stroke volume can be calculated like this, N diastolic volume minus N systolic volume. And it usually is about 70 mils, so 120 minus 50. Um, it's usually about 70 mils because usually N diastolic volume is 120 and N systolic volume is 50. And these numbers are from an average adult male at rest. So they certainly can vary during exercise or illness or something in different size bodies. Then another important calculation here, you can look at this stroke volume and this end diastolic volume, and you can calculate what's called ejection fraction. And they can do this with something as simple and really non-invasive as an echocardiogram. Oops, fraction, not fracture. Ejection fraction is going to equal the stroke volume divided by end diastolic volume, so you're going to get a percentage. Let's say stroke volume was 70 and end diastolic volume was 120, then you're going to you know, get something that is uh, roughly 50, 
50 to 70 percent, you know, depending on what the exercise situation is. So on average, you might be looking at an ejection fraction of about 60 percent is pretty normal. And then this becomes clinically relevant when you have someone that's had a heart attack and their heart muscle can no longer pump as much blood out as it used to. So stroke volume starts to go down. And if their end diastolic volume remains the same, so they're still filling it the same, but they're not ejecting as much, then this percentage goes down. So it decreases with um, heart failure or after um, a heart attack or a myocardial infarction. Sometimes we call that a myocardial infarction, an MI. Oops, sorry. Yes. So after a heart attack. Okay, so um, now I want to go back up here and talk a little more about end diastolic volume and some important um, terms. So what determines what end diastolic volume is? Well, it's going to be determined by basically uh, how much blood you have in your body and how fast it's coming back to the heart. So it's determined by a venous return. That's the rate at which the blood is coming back. The total blood volume. So how much there is available. And by um, compliance. And that's the stretchiness of the heart. So let me give you an example of what would make end diastolic volume very high. Let's say that someone's exercising. So this is increased by exercise. And that's because you have uh, skeletal muscles that are pumping, 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 and pushing the blood back up and through. And then total blood volume, let's say someone has, is well hydrated and they are not, they're not dehydrated, so they have plenty of blood that's able to come back in. And to make the situation as best as possible, that the cardiac myocytes are very stretchy. So this is um, stretchy myocytes. So uh, one term that you should know is um, preload. So end diastolic volume is also sometimes um, interchangeably used with the word preload. Now preload is technically the amount of pressure that is pushing on the ventricle walls during um, ventricular filling or at the end of it. But a lot of times in a clinical setting, you'll see uh, this volume just as a way to sort of estimate what preload is. Um, so then the next thing I want to talk about is what are some situations when you might have a problem here? So I'm going to use um, an orange pen and think about this situation here. What if someone had had multiple um, heart attacks or some other sort of heart muscle damage? And if they have that, then it might be replaced with collagen fibers that are scarred. And so you no longer have, um, it may decrease compliance, meaning that the heart is less stretchy, and that then is going to, you're going, if that happens, you're not going to be able to fill it as much, and so you're going to decrease end diastolic volume, and ultimately that's going to end up decreasing stroke volume, because the amount of blood that comes into the heart ultimately is a big predictor of what stroke volume will be. And then another thing that could happen is what about, so that's one problem, what about though if someone's heart is overly enlarged, like 
uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, for example. In that case, the heart is overstretched. And if it's overstretched, it's not going to be able to have as much leverage when it pumps and you're going to have a decrease in stroke volume. And sorry, these dots here, that means therefore you have a decrease in end diastolic volume in this situation and a decrease in stroke volume in this situation. However, these two things are extremely uh, related due to something called Frank Starling Law of the Heart. Let's go ahead and write that in red. So these were two physiologists that worked in the early 1900s. And what they established was that if stroke, or sorry, if end diastolic volume or preload increases, so if you increase end diastolic volume, you will increase stroke volume. And that actually how much blood pours into the ventricle is going to be the biggest determinant of how much blood gets pumped out. So it sort of makes sense, right? You can't have a big stroke volume unless you have a big end diastolic volume. And then again, remember, end diastolic volume is sometimes used, you'll hear the word preload instead. So you want to have a nice preload. You want to have a nice in, end diastolic volume. Uh, conversely, you want to have low afterload. So you don't want your heart to have to push really, really hard in order to open the semilunar valves to eject the blood. Okay, so then um, when we come to this last phase, isometric isovolumetric relaxation. You see that word there again. Iso means same and volume. So once again, all the valves are closed. And the reason that they're closed is because the pressure is still too high for the AV valves to open. but it is too low to keep the SL valves, the semilunar valves open. So in other words, the pressure has fallen in the semilunar, enough that the semilunar valves close, but it hasn't fallen enough that the AV valves open. But when that happens, finally, then you start ventricular filling and now you've completed the cycle and come back around. So to go over this one more time, the ventric ventricular filling is um, ultimately to reach a high end diastolic volume and um, that is going to be determined a lot by how stretchy the walls are of a healthy heart muscle. Then um, stroke volume is the amount that, of blood that is ejected during systole. And if stroke volume is very strong and you get rid of a lot of blood, your end systolic volume will be nice and low, which it should be. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can calculate the percentage efficiency of this by taking stroke volume divided by end diastolic volume, about 60% is pretty normal, but what you'll see is that patients that have had heart attacks or other heart damage, um, this number or this percentage will start to drop and they'll have what's called a low ejection fraction. And uh, during ventricular ejection, the AV valves are closed and the semilunar valves finally open. So you can always remember what's happening to the valves in the heart at different parts of the cycle based on the pressure. So remember, pressure has to be low for the AV valves to be open, and it has to be high for the semilunar valves to open. Okay, I'll see you in the next video.